Hi everybody, it's Catherine. Welcome back to my channel. It's been a little bit of a break um, because various things going on <laughs> and uh, I was in Ireland. So thanks Claire for being so patient. I also have tonsillitis or what seems to be tonsillitis flaring up. So I've, I've kind of moved in the mic a bit. Um, if there are any technical issues, let us know. Although we'll probably be able to tell ourselves. We might have to go audio only. We have to see. Um, so yeah, we're here with A Dance with Dragons. We're going from The Merchant's Man, which is Quentin, all the way to Danny 2, which is 6 to 11. Obviously, with the break in the schedule, I'll need to reorder the, all of the weeks in the... Um, in the, sh the current schedule i might even reduce it since we're going into the new year now anyway i might like reduce it to five a week maybe what do you think claire yes please <laughs> okay let's do that because um yeah since we're going anyway might as well reduce it i forgot to ask you before we started did you read the fire and blood extract no i didn't no ah, okay no. it's good no. but i will i will yeah. i just uh, the, the, when you sent it over to me, I, I could barely figure out my own name at the time. So, yeah. uh, but I will do. I will. It's read only it. about ten minutes. It's not very long. It's like it's. Is it's, it? Is it on George's? Is it called not a blog? Is yeah. that where? It, okay. All right. Yeah. It's very interesting stuff about the wall, which I think is kind of relevant Ooh. to Mel and stuff like that being up there at the moment. So, uh, really interesting really interesting wow. it's all oh. about alisan at the wall basically. oh my god right okay you've yeah. made me you've made me want to go i'll read it after we've done our podcast <laughs> i am um, i'm very excited for fire and blood though because i i hadn't really thought much about it but having read that little piece i'm like oh my god is this what it's gonna be <laughs> oh. yes au i am using a new mic uh, luckily because my my voice is at like a reduced volume uh, luckily for you guys but um yeah so i haven't read these chapters <laughs> since before my holidays so i kind of ran through summaries of them online today because i was like i can't even remember what happened and i don't really know what my notes are anymore um so well, ditto, to be honest i was okay. reading through my notes before and i just thought what I, 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 yeah i don't know what it, i don't know what half of them mean and I feel really bad for, for Catherine. I know what it's like to have tonsillitis. It's been a few years, but it's awful. It used to, I, I used to get it quite a lot when I was younger and it used to knock me on my backside. So yeah, I haven't had it in about 20 well, years. It's, it's awful. Just, yeah. So uh, I think we should try and wrap this up as quickly as we can. Yeah. And especially if we can't really remember the, de in a way it's going to be good when we can't remember yeah. the detail of the chapters. We can just think about the, you know why maybe a good a good thing to think about is like why why does that chapter exist why was it written what's the purpose okay. of it yeah um because to I be think honest we'll, a lot yeah. of my questions are kind of around that yeah yeah thank you au that's so sweet and i should say it's very painful having tonsillitis but i have the best husband in the world like Aww. he like he's been just amazing looking after me he's so <laughs> Um, but I also want to just a little bit of housekeeping. So I'll clean up the schedule and we'll do five chapters next week. So I'll have to see who that fifth chapter is. Um, but I also should announce that I got my con tickets for Nashville. So we're definitely going. And, um, uh, yeah, so we're going to the UK, obviously, to meet you guys, which I'm really excited about. I might be even more excited about that because that <laughs> involves polish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it probably will involve polish um uh, i au that sounds awful gargling apple cider vinegar Ugh. But i'll try it maybe i have some actually in the fridge i'll try it um all right so yeah. yeah so two cons definitely happening next year so i'm really excited about that and when's um, the nashville one again just remind me july i'll be over there yeah. for my birthday so Ooh. hopefully i started buying stuff for margaret as well <laughs> very excited well, if you've got eight months you'll be... <laughs> i managed to get the last brown collection for her oh brilliant in, oh yeah in germany so oh and Jeez. i also have to show yeah. you this guys 
Oh, I'm bringing it closer without dropping anything. This is the egg that Claire made me and the one that Nika made me. And I found this in TK Maxx. It's like a dragon candle holder and it's now Ooh. perfect for my two eggs. So Excellent. I'm so happy. I, I, <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, get stuck in with the merchant's man. Quentin's first chapter. What do you think of Quentin as a POV? <laughs> well, <coughs> he's a bit... And he's, that, he, that badly. <laughs> yeah. The thing that makes me laugh about Quentin is, uh, uh, the, considering this is written by a bloke, is uh, there's much more kind of soppy teenage love, like, oh, you know, coming from the male, young male characters than there are from the female characters. I think really only Sansa... It when she was very young was like deluded about the whole oh you know knights and like you know these wonderful stories of maids being you know rescued by gallant knights she's had her eyes open from that obviously but then you've got quentin's just really soppy over over danny and you also get um that other cow one of the one of the uh phrase that's all soppy about wanting to marry Aria, uh, it just yeah. So I, the thing that the thing that makes me that there's just so many questions here for me with um, with Doran, uh, Martel, and Dawn, and the son's son. I, I just it seems to be in this chapter, Quentin wants to make his father proud. That's his his main objective is he wants to make his father proud and he feels that his father has put the hands of Dawn, the fate of Dawn into the hands of, of, of Quentin. That's a huge, big responsibility. But I don't think that's what's happening here. I think whatever Quentin thinks is happening is not happening. I think it's kind of feels like, how did Doran ever think this would be successful? I mean, would, it's a disaster straight off the bat. Just the whole thing is just like, why did you do this? It feels like, again, that you're sending members of your family into peril, knowing that it's almost a suicide mission. Why? For what? Is it just all about you and your daughter? Every, is everything else really just disposable? Is it? I, d I don't. I, I don't. I don't quite know why. I don't know, maybe he's trying to just keep Quentin out of harm's way, but it just, the it whole did. thing just seems strange. Yeah, so I, I told Claire, but I don't think I've said it on the channel yet, but something that, because Ivan has come to the con with me, something that we want to do is maybe just read um, character chapters, like you talked about with Arya. Mm -hmm. uh, because he, he's, he's kind of dipped in and out of the books, but he wants to kind of, just like take a character at a time and we'll get maybe get through it a little bit faster than that uh, coming up to Nashville. But one of the things I want to do is take the two Martells mm. and read them chronologically because they sound so completely different. Mm. They're the, what drives them is very different. I think he does. I, I do agree with you. He does sound a little bit soppy, but He's so indecisive at the same time. It's like if he mm. didn't have this duty to Doran, he wouldn't know what he wants. Do you know that kind mm. of way? Even when he's talking about the girls that he likes or the girls that he's loved, mm -hmm. it all sounds very wishy-washy, not quite certain. I feel like maybe because there was certainty of him getting Dorn, that led to him on a path of uncertainty, which is com the complete not what you'd expect at all. Like, it's really ironic that he ends up being this kind of uncertain character and he, they're constantly kind of debating what the right decision is. And when the when the, they uh, get attacked and the maester dies, that's like the biggest thing for him is that he won't have the advice of the maester. It's like a maester can always is an answer. Even <laughs> though they wear grey, maesters ever, rarely give grey answers. You know what I mean? They, mm. constant, they seem to kind of fall on one side or the other. And I think Quentin, of all the people around him, that that is the biggest loss for him because mm. 
you know, that was the one person that had a certain answer that he could rely on. It's just, it's a, it's, it's coming off feast with Ariane as well. This is like, it's kind of, I felt it a little bit um, daunting going into Quentin's chapter because it's it's a little bit jarring just how different he is to Ariane. I don't know if that makes any sense. Hi, Connie. How are you? Yeah, I, I, I mean, this is just the chances of this mission being successful are very, very low. It's dangerous. Three of them, Kletos, Will and the Meister have all died so far. So three of them have already, half of the company uh, are already dead. We know that Quentin isn't the most, you know, he, he's not necessarily kind of eye-catching. He's not going to be some somebody who is, he doesn't he really even seem that sure of himself. So... <clears throat> personality looks blah blah what well, you know it's just like this is a bit of a doomed mission from the start why is it even happening i it it's it just the whole thing is is completely confusing to me i don't know yeah, danny don't would it. never be attracted yeah. to him not not like he can't yeah. know that now at this stage but we as the reader will know this guy would never wash is is it because is it was it just a very I mean for somebody like Doran who seems like uh you know he's a he, he plays the long game he's a long term planner he's got everything in place it's a little bit like uh, Littlefinger although Littlefinger kind of plays more onto the the side of chaos and and taking making making turning things around to his advantage. With Doran, it seems like he's had certain things in place, letters written, et cetera, et cetera, for a lot, you know, agreements around marriage proposals and things. All of this has been set in place a long time ago. So with, I mean, maybe he was just genuinely shocked at Viserys dying at the hands of the Dothraki, so much so that there was this knee-jerk reaction that just kind of messed his longer-term plans up a little bit, which... And, and that, unfortunately, meant that he made a bit of a shitty decision about sending his son. Otherwise, what is... Uh, it, just none of it. None of it. It, it was never going to be a successful mission, ever. It seems to me that he's he's a sacrifice. Mm. That that mm. Quinton is a sacrifice. Because it's Volantis, right? Where they're told... Where they just can't mm. get a boat. Is that right? Yeah, they're in old Volantis. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know, there's war coming. There's no slave trade. I mean, these kind of things, mm. that kind of information, spreads quite quickly. Mm. And like how they didn't know that even as they were approaching Volantis, is kind mm. of I, like Doran. All like how Doran doesn't know this yet. He, okay, he, even if Quentin left before this became apparent how Dora doesn't realize that this is happening and hasn't sent other people after them. Mm. Like it just seems that you're, you're literally sending your son into the dragon pit. Well, you like you say with the, you know, the Meister's dead, two other of the companions. I'd be like, okay, come on back, turn around, turn around, back you get, don't go any further. This was a complete fool's mission. Sorry. We'll sort something else out for you. Um, does he think that it, if his plans have changed and now he's pinning everything on Ariane rather than Quentin, I, I, I don't know whether that was ever the case at all in the first place, that Quentin was, you know, the whole thing about Dawn the, the, and the primogeniture, it, it's, it's, it, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, it's whoever the, the firstborn is and Ariane is older than Quentin. Does he feel that, I, 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 I can't help thinking that it's such a fool's mission that the only reason to do something like that is just to give you a small chance to survive by getting you out of harm's way in a scenario where it is 100% guaranteed that you're going to die. Yeah. And the only time I can think of, uh, the only reason that I can think of something like that happening is if there was some sort of civil war brewing between the two siblings, between Quentin and, and Ariane. I mean, if there is, Quentin hasn't a clue. Yeah. Yeah. Um. The. I mean, is is it the order of the green hat has the theory about the ironwoods 
and how Quentin kind of he leans to actually the opposite of the Martells. The Ironwoods are kind of their mm. old rivals of the Martells, yeah. I believe. Yeah, yeah. And that that's where the civil war might uh, might lie. But for me, mm. I just think like if Game of Thrones has been about anything, it's been about journeys. Mm. And we've seen a number of characters, Ariane, or sorry, not Ariane, um, Arya, Brienne. I put Brienne and Arya, Arya together there. Arya, Brienne, Jamie, uh, Sansa. We've seen loads of characters take on disguises to travel in mm. quite bleak areas, quite dangerous territories. Even Tyrion, who is the, the most conspicuous of all, he's even traveling under disguise. And I know Quentin is, but it feels like with all the might of Dorne, there's a better way to do this. Yeah. And to get you safely to Danny. This yeah. seems very convoluted. It seems like, I don't know, you could have been smuggled there. Like we get the Davos chapter later. I mean, was was there a way of smuggling you into Astapor? Surely. Yeah. Doran could have managed a smuggler like Salador Sand type character to bring him the whole way from Doran to Aspor rather than this route. Yeah. I don't know, maybe not. Maybe they can't sail those distances safely, although they should be able to. Um, I don't know. It seems th there's a lot wrong with it. Um, for me, it feels like it's a sacrifice that Doran is going to be able to use in Doran's favourite later on. Yeah. In favor later on, when Danny comes, he'll say, Look, this is why I, I sacrificed my son mm. for you. Or he'll be able to show to the whole of Westeros, while other um, families like Tywin Lannister w was keeping sons and daughters close to home. Mm. I, was, I was willing to sacrifice my heir to try and get dragons to Westeros to defeat the great other. I don't know. I'm not sure how much he's no. I don't know if it's just like that. It could be that you know because he's not. Well, he's it, it, not referenced in his own right. He's the son's son, mm. which kind of is still you know basically his father's instrument. Yeah. So, I've been binging on um, Vikings in my convalescence, <laughs> and some and similar thing happens with um, the King of Wessex. At one point, he he puts his son in a position where. It could it could work out in the king's favor, but it also mm. could go that it'll make the king look good as he kind of sacrifices his son. So yeah. either way, he wins, whether the son lives or dies. I feel like that's that's what's going to happen with Doran. Either way, whether Quinton mm. wins or live, lives or dies, it's yeah. going to work out for him. And I think he already knows that. Um, hello, Lady Laura. Thank you so much for. I love your autumn leaves. Thank you. <laughs> uh, representing my banner in emojis um connie says it's a naive mission about safety etc and mm. she was just going to say that quinton was the ironwoods uh, ward yeah um i don't really have much here uh do i have anything else i don't really have anything else here unless there's no, something you've... no we just i mean obviously it's the, a lot of these chapters are very much kind of travel log into new new different areas mm -hmm. there's a little bit of crossover from other characters or characters that we will see so for example we hear about the the triarchs in old Volantis, the mm -hmm. the you know three rulers that are there for a year amongst the old Valyrian families, and that they're they're not allowed to have their feet touch the floor. Yeah. Can you imagine that for an entire year? You're just carried everywhere. Um, we also um, run into how can we all, arrange that? Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. I thought in these in these chapters where there's. There's mention of things going on in the background, um, so we get we get reference to or introduced very briefly to this dwarf show that's happening. So yes. Penny and Grow, uh, and also the windblown as well. You know, we are we are the windblown die free. You know, we will die free. Blah blah. All of all of that kind of stuff with the, which again makes you wonder, with these cell swords, how free are they actually? I don't know. Uh, like again, it's a, it's a little similar up at the wall with the wildlings and the free folk. You know how are they? Are they free or are they? You know, there's just something that's. Um, 
Well, it's the same when we get to Davos and his duty to Stannis, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he's left with that kind of final point from Burrell, is it? Uh, is it yes. Uh, like, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's it, it, how free are you if you don't get to pick a side? Or yeah. if you have to, if you're stuck with the side you got, like, I guess it, that's, yeah. That's well, they're just, I, the, 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 the thing about the wildlings is they're just, they're, at the moment, they're just frightened, aren't they? They're just, mm -hmm. they're just frightened people uh, that are just kind of being herded and told what to do. It's all very tenuous, really, up at the east. But it's, 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 it could go either way at any point, and there's just this real feeling of, like, impending doom, which is obviously building up to what happens to John at the end of the books. But um, the other thing about this chapter that I thought was quite funny is... Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Barristan and Strong Belwas in that uh, in this chapter, Garris is playing the merchant and Quentin is playing the servant. And that's kind of so 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 the, the important person or the the, the more uh, you know the, the, the higher class or the, the kind of gentrified person is is the one that's playing the servant which is the same with barristan you know he was supposed to be belwas's um uh squire was mm. an, an old old squire but yeah. um it just made me think oh are there any other are there any other times in the books it happens a lot actually yeah yeah where there's uh, aria gets to aria's plays a servant several times yes yeah yeah, and also you know there's Duncan Egg, and you know there's there's the, it it happens a lot. But it, I guess what it what it shows us is because there's a pattern here. Should we be looking out for this at some point in the future where there's oh, characters we already know? Yeah, yes, mm. <laughs> like Pod, for example, like oh, okay. you know, or Ron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These these unassuming. Squires and servants that are actually disguised as, you know, I don't know. Interesting, but uh, yeah. So, so this is the introduction to Quentin, a bit of a lackluster character. Um, I find his chapters a little bit forgettable. Yeah, they are. I mean, I think yeah. towards the end, as you get into the, you know, yeah. the whole thing that happens towards it, I think his his chapters are more interesting, not so much for him, but. Who he meets along the way, and all the cell swords, and the the fact that you can see this flip flopping. He's very much integral to the to the whole Miranese knot, and kind of yes. you know the whole confusion about what the hell is going on here, who's on whose side, and you know yeah. So we get the introduction it, it, of Quentin. It feels a bit more like an Ario an Ario Hota chapter or something like that. It doesn't mm. feel like you said like in and of himself he doesn't he's just a pawn and i think that's ultimately what he is you know yeah. he's he's not a player he'll never be a player he's just being used um, mm. so uh lady laura is so sweet thank you so much and she's cooking italian sauce with ricotta cookies which sound amazing oh, very wow. lucky kids yeah. come to that yes and sir barristan is just amazing. Connie says, Miri Mazdor's comments to Danny about the mountains blowing in the wind like leaves makes you wonder, is she referring to the wind blown? That's a good, mm. I didn't think about that. That's interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, we might come back to that, Connie, because we have an interesting Danny chapter coming up with um, Quaith and Miss Sande and all that kind of thing. But that is mm. very interesting. Connie's always, she always like, gets me thinking about things so uh <laughs> our first of two john chapters tonight yeah. so uh we'll switch back to the five chapters a week and hopefully this won't happen mm. too much more but um i think it does happen a lot with Tyrion, where we get like Tyrion chapters almost back to back um but john this is the chapter that is from john's point of view that we we saw with sam i think it was sam two in feast i think anyway Oh yeah, it's this. This happens prior to Sam and Gilly leaving, which yeah. again is that weird. You, given that there was quite a, an amount of time, I think five years between feast and dance, and and really they should have come out the same. You know, they're simultaneous, really, aren't they? Yeah. So you have to switch back into oh yeah, Sam's still at the wall at this point. 
uh, oh, this chapter. Which I thought was confusing in A Song of Ice and Fire until I started watching Vikings and they skipped like four years, six years, 12 oh years. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, this to me is the chapter that if you were thinking at any point that it could be plausible that babies have been swapped before in the past, oh my God, this is the chapter for you. It's referenced so many times that, and just things like about saving the baby, saving, you know, save the baby. How can we do that? Oh, well, there's there's just so many things here. Only you can save the baby, Gilly. He does some really weird things like just, I don't know. John's not very good at being John. John, yeah. At this point, he's not he very good at being so a... different in dance. Yeah, he uh, and you know, and this is his uh, this is his point of view. There's all this stuff here about the last words that Meister Eamon said to him before he left: "Kill the boy." You know, in order to be a man to rule, you must kill the boy. It takes a man to rule. It, it takes a man to do the things that must be done. So do you think he would actually kill the baby? I don't think he would. No, I, he's threatening to. He's threatening to kill Gilly's babe because he, he knows that he has to do something pretty serious to get her to agree to this swap. But he's pretty, I mean, he makes a burn a hand and things like that by the candle, you know, toughen up and, and, and just, I don't know, it's just very strange. Um. He tells Gilly that he'll raise the boy at the wall. I mean, you know, the, the, how safe can that be? Good luck with that, yeah. Yeah. He's quite harsh with Sam. Um, and there's, there's a lot of just, just loads of stuff in here about, uh, you know, he orders Sam to hide his fears, to obey him and hide his fears. I'm not telling that you, you can't be craven, but just don't show it, show that. Don't let anybody know that. And that's what the order is. You must obey yeah, he's, that. He's very tough here. Um, so my question for you in the chat. So do you think John, as we have John right now in these chapters, would kill Gilly's baby if he had to? Um, and do you think John the White would be more capable of doing something like that? Because mm. I feel like mm. John the White might be a bit different. And yeah. might lay up the pros and cons a bit differently, but yeah. obviously, you know, the mo monster isn't there. But um, it, it is funny though what you're saying about the baby swap because um, it's funny because I go home usually in October. Facebook like regularly like throws up pictures of this at this time of year of pictures that I've taken with my nephews, and since they were babies, even though I don't see them that much, I can recognize. <laughs> that like it's still the baby that is now the little boy you know mm -hmm. seven years later and four years later or whatever um it just like how bad are they at like telling these kids apart i mean gilly's baby is over a year old now right yes yeah and monster is very young but big yeah so is it something to do with you know Babies don't really survive that long, so people maybe don't get attached to them and don't really pay attention that much. Like maybe we well, that's, do. Well, that's that's one of the reasons why they're not named until they're is it two two years old? Yeah, they're not, like they're not named because again, there's that there's that element of don't get too attached, <laughs> you know. But just the fact that, that I mean, in this chapter, John dreams about babies and heads swapping from one baby to the other and he also thinks about how well yeah i'm going to be able to get away with this because as you've said that you know the babies are kind of close enough in age and size sort of and it's like that's definitely ha it's it's got to have happened before there's been this swapping of king sons has yeah. definitely happened before it, it could have even happened before r plus l it certainly alludes to r plus l equals j and it um 
it, well, I think I think you're right. Well, first of all, mm -hmm. this has only happened once before that we've got the same event from two different POVs. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that other event was Tyrion's trial by combat, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, probably the most that cat Tyrion of um, journey and interaction, probably the most important event that kickstarted all of the the, the 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 war of the the clash of kings basically mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the next four chapters after this very important pov where we also got this in feast it's Tyrion, and this is where he's going to meet young griff for the first yeah. time yeah. then it's davos one no yeah. reason why davos one has to be there but it is all about smuggling. It is all about yeah. uh, babies and bastards as well. Then back to John 3, which is about Mance being yeah. swapped. And then into Danny 2, where she gets very cryptic words from um, Quaith. And we also get this really strange interaction with Miss Sande as well. Um, so there are four chapters running after this where the POVs or what they're talking about could all be linked back to a baby swap of yeah. some sort. Yeah. Yeah. It's through it. It runs throughout this chapter. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and now going back to what my Strayman said, his last words, it takes a man to real kill the boy to do the things that must be done. Also the key thing about my Strayman in this, in this chapter that's referenced is this, this portion of the, 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 the crucial bit that's in the Jade Compendium, the book that he leaves him. So it's all about the lands of the Jade Sea and there's a, there's a particular passage of interest that he's marked for John. And it seems like that passage is about Azura High and Lightbringer. So from Meister Eamon's point of view, I guess what he's saying there is, I think you are Azura High this is what you need to know you've got to kill kill everything else kill all these childish notions of whatever because it's going to take a real man to do what needs to happen next here's a clue read this read this passage of interest in this book to prepare yourself for it but um knowledge is a weapon knowledge yeah knowledge is a weapon it is uh well especially yeah. because we have since clash i believe we've been talking about the fact that there's a lot of reason to believe that mormont and Eamon and probably benjen almost certainly benjen knew who john was mm. and mm. um the the guy who made the weapons uh the one-armed guy mm. i can't think of his name there's a there's a strong chance that they all knew who john was when he arrived at the wall mm. and that 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 they were there waiting for him almost because that was inevitably where John would end up. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some great ideas uh, in the chat. Connie says, William Darry takes the Tar kids. Gendry and Arya are taken by Yoren. Ned takes John and Theon. Mm -hmm. Peter takes Sansa and maybe Tyrek. Yeah, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Lady, uh, Lady Laura says, uh, I certainly hope Gilly's baby is not a baby. <laughs> if he's written into season eight. I mean, that baby that they used, or he's not really a baby, he was like close to toddler age, beautiful looking child mm. when they went to Horn Hill. Mm. Um, gorgeous looking child and definitely piercing eyes. So there's definitely importance in the baby for sure. And Connie also reminds us that Davos took um, Edric. So that's very true. Mm. Yeah, I forgot mm. about that. And uh, oh, Elamor is here. Hi, Elamor. How are you? Um, Hello. <laughs> I've been very jealous over your pump pumpkin picking pictures. They're beautiful. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah. So the 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 thing I wanted to talk about as well is John kind of loading up the bases along the wall, mm. and uh, something really struck me. I don't know why. Um, uh, ice mark. Yeah, um, I don't know why I never thought about this before. That's a very unusual name, right? Mm -hmm. So it made me look at the other castles and made me wonder, are they all named by different groups or were they all named by different groups? 
So Castle Black may be named by, I don't know, the Night's Watch maybe, but mm. the Shadow Tower might be named by somebody else. Mm. And maybe Ice Mark, maybe that was named by Whites. I don't know. It just seems like when you look at all the names, then it starts to, they don't seem to fit together that well. I don't know. There's something a bit weird about the names of the castles. Uh, the, 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 the thing that I got from that is that it was funny that the, he'd sent somebody who had the nickname Giant. So he sent a giant to protect Ice Mark, which just make me think that there's some sort of connection between the giants and the wall not just in terms of building it but like you know giants awakened for, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know i think there's some bigger connection between giants and the wall like they're embedded in it or there's some sort of spe something to do with the spells that are attached to the wall um the size of the wall is its weakness that's an interesting concept. I mean, yeah, the, 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 there are, I mean, you hear Ned, isn't it Ned who refers to walls being like how important walls are for defence, but it's only as strong as the men who, you know, who are there to defend it. So the fact that there are so few men to defend the wall and the fact that it's so enormous with so many castles it's like 300 miles long something like that that's longer than i know that it's about 220 miles from manchester to london and that's like a day's travel pretty much uh mm. well you know it depends on how, how you're traveling uh certainly if you're traveling on a on a horse it would definitely take an entire day if not more um that's that so so it's going to take more than a day to get from one end of the world to the other so and there's very few people to to defend it but yeah. so that's interesting because the night's watch have added to it over the centuries right mm -hmm. they have built it up so mm -hmm. it wasn't that tall to begin with um mm -hmm. so uh and remember george was inspired by hadrian's wall but hadrian's wall is quite short and yeah. they may have had wooden structures that kind of lengthened it but mm -hmm. it, it served as much as a border as it did as um a method of defense mm. so it was kind of they think that it was probably more of a border because there are gates there were gates in the wall and um, but also it, like you said it's kind of difficult it makes it difficult for you to defend it like you can't really use archers that well mm. if it's that big um like it's going to be difficult to use archers effectively they have to be really well trained but it's, it, there's like, what, what is the idea here? Are you going to keep building on it indefinitely? That doesn't seem to be what they were supposed to do no. with it. Yeah. Um, it, it, speaking of archery, it's interesting that even though Sam is barely in this chapter, we managed to squeeze into it that Sam promises to, um, he mentions his archery practice again, that he's been, you know, I, I, I have been practicing. And John tells him that he can continue his practice in Old Town. He is going to kill somebody significant with a bow and arrow, and it's going to be Crow's Eye in Old Town. And whether he's, whether it's by accident or not, Sam and archery intrinsically linked and something it just it's just mentioned so many times of Pluto. it's yeah. sam in old town with the, yeah. with, the with, bow. with the bow and arrow yeah not the professor in the library with the candlestick <laughs> right through the crow's eye yeah <laughs> um ion is here hi ion um a, a song of names and symbols indeed um lady laura asks are we watching a discovery of witches which sounds fascinating Ooh. i've written it down so i'm going to be looking into that it's on sky one okay i'm definitely going to be looking into that mm. um and yeah can't wait till it comes to america yeah uh, okay i'm definitely going to be looking into that thanks for the tip um so uh yeah so uh so obviously slint <gasps> we have yeah i i just there are certain phrases that are said in this series that just give you that just either chills or fist pump moments and this is one of them ed fetch me the block is here in this chapter right at the end there's no mercy from john whatsoever 
Stannis nods and off comes Slint's head, who irritatingly constantly referred to himself in the third person. So annoying. Oh, I hate when people do that. Lord Slint would not do this. Lord Slint would. And, and in the end, he's just a silly little man who. I, I, the only it. person I forgive doing that is Cookie Monster. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, Stannis kind of gives him the nod of approval. Mm -hmm. It made me wonder does Stannis want Slint dead anyway? Because Slint was very dishonorable, like as a person. Well, he's kind of Lannister camp, isn't he? You know, so I don't think it's any skin off Stannis's nose whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. We, we might talk a little bit more about Stannis and what the hell they're doing and all that kind of thing in, in mm -hmm. the next John chapter. Was there anything else for this John chapter? No. Sorry, guys, if you're getting here late, I don't have the lamp on because I'm not feeling 100%. But we're going to persevere and move on to Tyrion 3. So, um, yeah, this is this is another. It's if it, it felt a little bit like the Quentin chapter. We're yeah. getting thrown all these new characters and new locations, and you're like, oh god, and yeah. new kind of rumors, and it's like, oh damn it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I like you know, there's some things that you're like, I forgot all about that coming up in this chapter. I forgot that this is thrown. This is just one of these things that just yeah, like I forgot all, that the Shrouded Lord came up in this chapter. I forgot mm. that this is the chapter where all of that happens. Um, I, I have to say, one of the best, for me, one of the best introductions to secondary character, meeting Griff is brilliant in this chapter. I love, yeah. I just love the way he he, he takes in Griff and you feel like you get a real sense of the character before you even get a POV from him. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, like, it's just, it's just a really good good way of doing it so Tyrion so what do you think of he's not as he's not as self-loathing in this chapter it's it's a nice change no he's he's curious isn't he so he wants to find out what's going on so it's, and also just getting away from Illyrio and the it, it was starting to feel really cloying and claustrophobic that journey with all the food and everything so I think he's just quite happy to get away from it there's a couple of little nuggets that are mentioned in this chapter that are for way further on towards the end of this book, like Carl Pono is mentioned. So this Dothraki horde of 30,000 that's mentioned that's this 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 threat, um, the Dothraki, the Dothraki threat is somewhere here around the corner and we're just tantalizingly kind of given little hints of it. Of course Doesn't we that put like Quentin's journey in all like all oh, the more naive yeah, like yeah, yeah, the, the, all these things are like this isn't this isn't secret information all this stuff is out there for you to know yeah you know yeah anyway sorry <laughs> uh no we well I'd, I, I've got very few notes to be honest with you on this chapter we we meet Holdren Duck and we also very briefly see do we see Connington, I think we do very yeah, we briefly. Do. Yeah. yeah. So this is where and the scepter and young Griff and the shy maid. So this is this is um this is this is a completely new turn of events for, for Tyrion. There's there's a couple of things that I've made note of. The fact that he chose the name Hugo Hill for his like yeah. you know un undercover pseudonym. And I've in my notes I've put Hugo Hill, King or Bastard, because Hill is a bastard name, but also in the world of Ice and Fire, Hugo Hill was a king. I think he was a king in the Westerlands, possibly. Oh, really? so I don't know. Somebody remind me if you've got more I'm gonna look it up. Ice and Fire knowledge than me. Maybe Iron Throne will know that. Is there any significance to Tyrion choosing the name Hugo Hill as his kind of bastard pseudonym name? Um, interesting. <laughs> also interesting that Illyrio says, I'll join you in Westeros. I didn't, it didn't even really occur to me that Illyrio had any plans to go to Westeros or meet anyone in Westeros. He, um, or... Sorry, Hugo Hill was the first king of the Andals. Oh my god, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a bastard name. 
Mm. So again, that goes back to something that I've said previously about is there any significance to the bastard names being linked to, um, it's like an elemental thing, you know, snow, hill, flowers, there's something, that, I know it's supposed to be where, like the location of where you're from, but also there are kings in the past, ancient kings in the Age of Heroes. Um, I don't know, I feel as though at the moment in the books, everybody thinks, you know, being a bastard is a bad thing. Being a bastard means that you're harder and meaner and old, you age quicker than, you know, there's something really bad about being a bastard. But actually, is that going to be turned around before yeah. the end of the series where, um, when it comes to the significance of names? Uh, yeah, so as you mentioned, we've got uh, the Prince of I, Sorrows. I, sorry, before you yeah. say anything, I undared to mention the L word, which is lost. Oh, I, un God. I can't tell you how deeply scarred I am from lost. <laughs> I was so, so lost was my first kind of fandom thing where I was on all the forums and I was in, like deep into theories. And then that last episode, just it I, was can't, disappointing. I can't even make jokes about it either. so much so much time <laughs> invested yeah i yeah. think you see when i hear hugo i think of the cocktail <laughs> elderflower and prosecco i think yeah and mint. okay delicious. okay delicious but anyway <laughs> sorry you were saying about the prince of sorrows sorry prince of sorrows <laughs> the shrouded lord the gray kiss so this is the gray grace so uh we get this legendary character that's that's also described as being like Lan the Clever, you know, a legendary character like Lan the Clever. This is where I'm certain the link comes from uh, Garion going missing however long ago, now being the, the Shrouded Lord. Yeah. And the fact that, again, we get this like Lan the Clever, you know, he's a, that the Shrouded Lord is a Lannister. Uh, so that 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 was quite interesting. The, the, there's lots of um, there's lots of again tantalising little nuggets of history yeah. in this chapter. So we get lo about Longstrider's book. So the seven the seven wonders and the seven man made wonders. So like the Dragon Road. Uh, in fact, I think Garion is even mentioned. Just going back to, I'm just ch ch checking my notes here. Garion is even mentioned in this chapter. I'm pretty sure. So not, he is. Yeah, not just Lamb the Clever, but Garion is also. Tyrion mentioned. thinks about um, Tywin wouldn't let him travel. Mm. Mm. And um, which I don't really understand why Tywin wouldn't let him travel. Like, why not mm. let him out? Like, mm. why not let him kind of go and do whatever he wants would not yeah. get him out of his hair mm, but it's a funny, um, it's a funny one Elamore and Connie have didn't get into Lost don't ever yeah. never yeah. <laughs> just, just save your time why I'm, yeah. why I'm yeah. worried for Westworld but we'll be fine, be fine. Um, but yeah there's, just as you said there about history there's lots of references to mythical beasts and creatures and legends mm. and fictional and real and it's kind of it's a bit like uh it's a bit like unclear as to what's real and what isn't mm. so it's quite nice to meet young griff in this way to say goodbye to lirio and then meet young griff it's like what's real what's a legend what's mythical with john Khan, you know it's all like it's all yeah. kind of it's a really nice setting for it so I do, I mean, it's a nice chapter. I'm not sure if there's a huge amount in it um, other than what we discussed, but um, yeah, mm. unless there's anything else you, we're flying through them tonight, guys. Uh, yeah, we are, we are, yeah. D d uh, the reference to Griff has sucked on hate and it just made me wonder, uh, is that hate of Robert Baratheon? For but basically, that's the only thing I can think. It must be hate of Robert Baratheon for killing his beloved Rhaegar. Yes, yeah. th th there's got to be th that can be the only thing. So he, if he is, uh, it, yeah, I'm, I'm still the, the jury's still out for me on whether or not Griff 
you know whether or not Connington is is uh, is going to end up being a good guy or not. But he's I mean he's he's not he's not well, is he? <laughs> he's not a well man at the end of the at the end of the No, book. he's not he's, I don't think there's gonna be a magic overnight stay at the Citadel. No. No. Um no. you know, I don't think that's gonna happen for John. No. Uh I think yeah. But uh yeah, we'll we'll get more action, I guess. I guess the next Tyrion chapter, that's when John will get his mm -hmm. sickness. Right, yeah, I'm guessing yeah. that's when they'll, they'll be. So, uh, then we're into Davos One. Mm. This is these are the exciting chapters for me because this is all conspiracies and what's going on. And um, as Davos is on his journey, because I feel like of all the characters, when Davos takes a journey, it's very quick and mm. he, he finds himself in a location very quick very quickly so this is like one of those rare occasions where he stops off and has a chat and it's nice and we get we get some tantalizing information about something that may or may not have happened with a fisherman's daughter um that was the is that the reason for this chapter i think is so. that, that because the rest of it i haven't I, I, I don't understand why we're here <laughs> if it wasn't just to hear that if, if it, it seems were... that the whole chapter is built around that mm -hmm. and yeah there's, there's very few things that i've got from this chapter so i'll i'll tell you what i observed is uh and i don't know whether it's just been a, a while since i uh look back at my notes for this chapter but Davos describes himself as being sick of storms. Uh, I mean, my God, he's lost his sons in the storms and he's just, the travel that he's been having is absolutely horrendous. He's sick of, sick of storms, which just made me think of the phrase storms end. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, uh, will davos is he beginning to or will he at some point resent his connection to stannis and i think well, he I will think... i think there's a possibility that that davos and stannis won't have a good relationship at the end of this story um no i mean burrell says to him if you lose you were never here basically mm. saying if you're on the wrong side i don't want to know you yeah well, he, yeah. he is on the wrong side right now, but he may not be on the wrong side in the future. Mm -hmm. And that information about Ned and the fisherman's daughter, it, like it feels like a jigsaw piece and there might be an, somebody else with another piece um, that Davos might meet and put together. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of theories out there that the fisherman's daughter may be a Shara Dane mm -hmm. and they're there's a lot of convincing theories that this is a Shara and that Ned, that she was disguised as a fisherman's daughter, perhaps. Mm. Um, mm. I don't know how that would work again. A Shara is strikingly beautiful, so we don't get any description like that of the fisherman's daughter. But um, mm. it's not beyond the realms of possibility that they could, you know, throw a card in her pocket and... timeline wise there is scope for <laughs> there is scope for uh ned and ashara to have spent quite a bit of time together before yep. uh, before the you know before things really started to kick off that you know up to about a, a year um of just kind of going off on their own adventures so they may have turned up there you know and there's lots of disguise going on um there's all this stuff about Storm's End that I've got, um, gods and storms and uh, Davos learns that Lys is dead and, he, well, that's another, you know, I mean, that he could have found that out anywhere. Um, but uh, Melis Melisandre, he, he's thinking about Melisandre saying that storms are fueled by sacrifice and there's this thing about dead, dead man screams um gods and storms and davos is sick of storms so you know it, i don't know i don't know i haven't got a massive amount of this so we're in sister sisterton it's a smelly vile town 
the people that he meets here just you know i i that's the only thing i really remember from that chapter is this little nugget of maybe ned was here at some point and you mustn't tell anyone what happened not that well, we ever really know what happened but it is it does it's important as well because salador san is kind of burning his bridges with stannis and by association with davos and this isn't the first time that they've had like this kind of breakdown um mm. salador san is completely justified here there's stannis hasn't delivered yeah. on any promise to anybody no and it makes me wonder why does anybody follow him because it just seems like everything <clears throat> excuse me it just seems like I, I I can't think of anybody that has benefited from Stannis except Mel, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody else has really benefited. I know there's going to be a lot of Stannis people that are going to come after me now, but I feel like it's a bit, I don't know. I, I He's sitting around at the wall now for ages, mm -hmm. months, right? How long have mm -hmm. they been at the wall? It feels like they've been there for months. Yeah. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe feast. Excuse me, but it's it's. I don't know. Mm. It just feels a little bit. Uh, and I agree with Elamore. Elamore says I don't like that Stannis punished Davos for helping him. I've never re re liked that idea that Stannis cut off his fingers for smuggling in onions, mm. and because he was a smuggler, and he's a very honourable man. It's like Ned Stark got a reputation for being an honourable man. And yet he did some kind of shady stuff on behalf of his the very dishonorable Robert Baratheon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure how these reputations get spread around. I wonder, is there a different reason as to why he took Davos's fingers? I'm, I'm, I'm certain of it. I'm absolutely certain of it. Uh, Could it have some... something to do with grayscale? <laughs> Possibly, yeah, could be, yeah. Could it be that maybe he, I don't know, how old, was Shireen? No, Shireen wasn't born, was she? No, she wasn't born at the time of the siege, so that's no. a stupid idea. No, I'm just, it, there's just some, something that's never sat right with me about that. I don't know, I don't know. Mm. Uh, uh, d -d -d Lady Laura, oh, uh, Connie says Septa Moore might be the fisherman's daughter interesting um mm. lady laura says stannis was all was all business no pleasantries about him um i think he showed no mercy when it came to loyalty and ella moore says i prefer people who are not as rigid maybe so that davis would think of doing something sage sage uh, shady the next time to give him a warning mm. um probably yeah it's it's very it's very strange but I kind of I love your idea and MP's idea that there's something other than onions on mm. board. Mm -hmm. Um, that's yeah. Uh, so yeah. So how soon do you think Davis will switch sides? Do you think? Because I think this is if this chapter is all, if it's about Davis at all, it's about him switching sides eventually and being on the side that I, will lose. I, I, I think it all depends on whether or not he runs into Rickon, whether we'll ever see Rickon again, whether or not he'll, he, he completes this mission to go to Skagos. Whether Sam back... burns Shireen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that will be the moment. If that's yeah. going to happen in the books, which, oh, my God. I think all the signs are that it is going to happen. But I don't think it'll be with Stannis's knowledge. I think it'll really? be something that I think it'll be something that Mel does at the wall. Stannis is nowhere near the wall at the moment in the books. He's 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 uh, around near Winterfell, isn't he? He's ready for the the big fight with the yes. with the Boltons. Um, he's luring them towards the frozen lake or something, isn't it? Yeah, and maybe she feels that the only way that Stannis is going to win. Although she seems to have changed her mind, though, doesn't she? On um, who who yeah, was all right? I'm not sure. Now. I feel so, like. I feel like it will be Stannis. I think that's going to be the big throwing the book across the room for all the Stannis fans. Well, if it is, then that will be the moment that Davos switches switches sides. I and I think Stannis. I don't I know. I've just got this feeling that when Davos goes to Skagos, he will become this father figure for for Rick uh, Rickon. 
and that if uh, what's her face is still alive osha she called? osha if osha is still alive by this point she will she will be like a mother figure yeah uh and davos is definitely like he's a he is just the quintessential father figure uh i, I think they will be like his parents like osha and davos will become like rickon's you know tutor guidance Council, you know the whole the whole thing that he, he'll have what he needs in terms of like parental input from yeah. those two and that, that maybe that will be the thing that gets Dav you know davos is like ultimately is a father isn't he you know if, yeah. if the embodiment of the of the of the seven then he is the father and he's lost all his kids so he needs to he needs to be a father to somebody that's been the so, heartbreak davis has lost yeah. so much mm, not just mm. his fingers <laughs> like yeah. he's lost his kids mm -hmm. how many sons three sons yeah he's got and he's uh, got two left he's got uh he's got he, well he's got dev devon is it devon uh who's who was like devout and mm. with uh with the queen i think uh, uh what she called felice yeah or Celise, whatever it, yeah um and um i don't know I I actually it just occurred to me will davis lose the same number of children as he's lost fingers that would be quite mm, poetic. Mm. And he's got two younger sons. That's what I was thinking of. He's got two younger sons as well with his wife, hasn't he? That he yeah. never he never gets to see. Well, um, maybe we will. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I feel but like I think he will. With Davis, I get this kind of Russell Crowe idea of him like running his hand through the fields of corn on, at the beginning of Gladiator. <laughs> like that's <laughs> kind of my idea of Davos going home. <laughs> but, oh, excuse me. Um, do we think that uh salad salador will betray stannis though is that a given oh god i hope not mm. i hope not i hope if he does that he'll do what he said he'll do and he'll go to the wife and look after her. i mean that's one thing he could do he could kidnap the wife and kids yeah. couldn't he because he knows yeah. where they are mm -hmm. um yeah it is funny that's Davos ended up that his wife and kids ended up living so far away mm. that they're not in King's Landing or Storm's End because they're 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 up on the northeast, right? Is that right? That's what I have in my head. I could be completely wrong about that. What's that? Anyway, he knows where they are, so mm. and he mm. seems to be the only one. So um, Stannis may not even give a shit. He may not even care where they yeah. are. But, yeah. Um, so speaking of Stannis, then, will we get into John three? Because I, the thing that sticks out to me in John three, mm. apart from the man stuff, but just talking about Stannis burning Shireen, mm. uh, Stannis is burning weirwoods for his fires. Yeah. Uh, will the old gods? demand a fire sacrifice or fire vengeance of some or like will they demand a burning of mel for instance uh, or uh, some 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 sort of vengeance for what will there be some sort of um major divine rep like vengeance here yeah whether or not it's burning I'm yeah, it may not be burning. Yeah. yeah, I think it's probably more to do with ice magic that we don't know too much about. Probably be a blood sacrifice. A maybe. Blood, blood magic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that quote, though, a piece of the old gods to feed the new. Yeah. That completely feeds into my theory of the old gods somehow feeding into this new religion uh and the rainbow reflections off the wall and all that kind of stuff and the rainbow crystals i th genuinely think there's an element of the old gods that have been hidden into in this new religion 
and that quote, a piece of the old gods to feed the new, to me seems like there's one religion that's being woven into another religion here. And everyone is actually worshipping the old gods, but they're being led to believe that it's this new religion, the new Well, gods. I mean, that happened in our own world, you know. Mm. Christianity, when it was struggling to battle um, theologically with pagan religions, it just kind of adopted the pagan, like all the saints. Yeah. Uh, that kind of notion of the saints is kind of a way of appeasing mm -hmm. um, the the polytheistic pagans that were in Europe, right? So yeah. it was it was a way of kind of, and then later on, the Reformation is kind of a trying to oh, is trying to correct that and make it a purely mm -hmm. monotheistic religion take the divine power from Mary and mm. um, the saints and anything else and trying to cut that out of it, out of the Catholic faith. But Catholics, a lot of Catholics came from pagan traditions, yeah. even generations away. I know that in Ireland, we have a lot of, a lot of pagan stuff that go, that goes mm -hmm. into our faith. Mm. I mean, as many people believe in God in, in Ireland as they do in fairies, I can tell you. <laughs> so, yeah. And, yeah. you know, the banshee and all that kind of thing. So it's but still it, there in the culture. So I think your idea is spot on with that. It is there in really obvious religious ceremonies like marriage ceremonies. Oh, there's so many things that are attached to a, a wedding, to a marriage yeah. ceremony that are, a pay, you know, pagan, rooted in pagan traditions like the flowers and uh you know the the, the what you call it the bouquet the bride's bou bouquet and also you know t t typical christian relig religious um events like christmas yeah christmas tree is pagan massively rooted in yeah. in paganism which means to me what it what that says to me is if you've got a whole load of people worshiping something that is actually feeding into feeding a new religion basically will the oh god what am i trying to say here the old gods will be stronger because they're being worshipped unknowingly <laughs> but they're being worshipped um which makes them stronger and i absolutely think that there'll be some kind of old gods retribution with Mel. I think, I mean, I used to think, maybe not so much now, I think this is just my fantasy version of what, because I can't stand Mel. I think she's just, I, I don't know why, in the books and in the show, I just, she's one of my least favourite characters. And I think that Val as I've said this before, Val is the white witch, like, and and Mel is the red witch. Ice and fire. Women shouldn't be at the wall. It's in the vows. I think there's a reason why women shouldn't be on the wall, and because they're there at the moment, you've got all the wildling women, obviously, but you've also you've also got an ice witch and a fire witch, and I think there will be some massive, monumental, magical battle between. Uh, I don't think this will happen, but this would be my fantasy. Some big bitch fight between Mel and Val, where Val wins, the wall comes down in the process, and that's what ends Mel. Well, um, I don't want to give you a spoiler for the fire and blood thing, but do you want a little spoiler? Mm. So the the fire and blood extract that was released two weeks ago now, I think, at this stage. Um, Alassane apparently like notes how uncomfortable the dragon was at the wall. Didn't like it. Right. Um, but I wonder, is that because she's a woman at the wall? I wonder, yes. is that mm. her projecting? Mm. Now maybe, maybe maybe dragons won't be comfortable at the wall. I don't know. Mm. I mean, mm. certainly you know in the, the 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 show they're kind of circling. They don't want to leave. That's the kind of thing that Danny is thinking. Oh, they're not leaving, but maybe they just don't like it. Maybe so, maybe yeah. uh, maybe it's a presence of a woman there. But it just I mean that would be epic if that's how the wall comes. I, that would be my like like fantasy of how the world comes down is a it's massive gonna fight. It's going to have to be 
yeah, because I feel like it's going to be smaller than the way they did it because mm. it has to be from a POV that's on the wall. Or like to get to get it to be like, I don't know. Mm. I don't know for it to be the way it was on the show. Like we ha we could enjoy that from a distance. There's not mm. one character apart from Tormund, I guess. Um, but like I feel like it's gonna have to be to get the full scale of it. It's gonna have to be from a distance, maybe through Bat Bran, perhaps. Mm, maybe. I feel like to get the full effect of it in text, that's gonna be tricky. Um, but then uh, if anyone can do it, George, through, can. or through a ghost P POV. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the the only thing that will bring the wall down is magic, yeah. uh, and including dragons it, with it, in that you know some sort of magical event. There's will certainly bring the something down. magical about Val. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Uh, what else did I want to say to you about this now? So yeah, we have the whole manse being burnt. Manse being burnt. Um, mm. here and obviously John knows because he keeps referring to him as the king rather than mm. Mance mm. Um, so yeah uh, yeah I'm not really sure um, I'm not really sure how they got past Mel with that the glamouring she's obviously crap mm. but um mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you mentioned this in the last chapter as well. John being shown things by Eamon um, about Lightbringer and things like that. Um, he remarks on Stannis's sword being cold, not yeah. hot. Yeah. So if Lightbringer is supposed to be hot and warm to the touch constantly, um, does that mean that its powers come from? not from old gods that sounds closer to R'hllor than anything else mm. yeah uh, mm. is it a combination I don't know I don't know I mean, it, uh, the, the only thing that, that what I got from this is that John finally sits down and reads the bit in the Jade Companion that refers to Azor Ahai he links that to I don't think like this is Lightbringer because it's so he's basically figuring out what Eamon says to Sam in the previous book. That wasn't Lightbringer. There was no I couldn't there would you know there was no heat coming from it. So John figures this this out himself. He start he has some weird thoughts. He has some like strange thoughts and dreams in this chapter about him being about ghost being part of him. So again, this is all leading up to what's going to be happening to him at the end of the at the end of the book but he also thinks about his lot so he's reflecting on where he's at now so he's lost you know he's lost uh, sam he sent sam away um he no longer has meister Eamon. he's got lots of wildlings and free folk that who knows whether or not they'll keep the faith nobody knows at this point some will some won't it's a very delicate piece that's going on. He's literally just beheaded Janice Slint. So everybody's complaining at the moment. The wildlings are trying to kind of be complicit because like I said, they're just frightened. They're scared to death of what, what, what what's behind them. Uh, and the men of the Night's Watch are not happy that their mortal enemy is being allowed to come through the wall. Yeah, can I ask you about that? Because I'm torn on that, especially mm -hmm. after this reread. <clears throat> um, should John be letting the wildlings through the wall? I mean, on a humanitarian level, of course, yes. The answer mm -hmm. is yes, of course. Mm -hmm. But do they have a point? Should they leave the army at the? Should they leave an army of men at the other side of the wall to fight them off, or like, to attempt to fight them off, like cannon fodder? I mean, is it more dangerous? Like, I guess in John's head, they're just going to become part of the white army. Mm -hmm. So you're you're kind of mm -hmm. just adding to the army that's coming. But like, it's it, he's making it very difficult to win people to his side who haven't seen the others. 
Mm. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, in his mind, it's just about the, the living and the dead, isn't mm. it? And the, and the wildlings, you know, they're red-blooded, they have a pulse, they're still alive. So it is going to be very difficult to sell that concept to anybody. I mean, he's having trouble just with the Night's Watch and they know what's, what's coming. So... Um, Do you it, think there will be that thing that they did in the show where they go and get a zombie and bring it and kind of try to prove... Mm, I, I feel like that's not going to happen. No, I don't. I hope it doesn't because he could have done that now mm. <laughs> to try mm. and convince the Night's Watch. We need to get the... We don't want more of these guys. Um, mm. But I don't know. Um, hi, Just Me uh, in the chat as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, but yeah, just... I, I, I don't know. I, it, like you said in the last John chapter, it doesn't sound like John... But I feel like his last chapter in Storm was already gearing up to very different type of John. I think that's when he becomes, when Ghost comes back, that's when it's like, okay, you're never leaving me again. I'm going to give in to whatever this mind melding thing is going on. There's, It's way more, it's a way stronger link. I've said this before, I'm like a broken record. Then... The others, it feels like then like the Arya and Bran, it feels like John is kind of constantly in a ghost-like state. Mm. And when you're in these POV chapters, that kind of detached kind of survival instinct is very strong. Mm. Um, well, he has to keep reminding himself, doesn't he? I, I, because he, in his dreams, when he has these wolf dreams, he... Uh, he tastes the blood in his mouth. He wakes up with the feeling of blood, the taste of blood in his mouth. And he has to remind himself, no, 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 no. I'm not a wolf. I'm a man. I'm not a wolf. I'm a man. This is so, it's, there's, there's no possible way that there isn't going to be some sort of body swap with Ghost, who's clearly very much part of him because you don't get this even with even with bran no. who has really vivid wolf dreams you don't i mean yeah he, you know he gets to taste the meat and he's eaten smell he, he eats as in as bran and then he eats as 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 summer but um varamir is the closest i think mm, mm. Uh, and varamir was very strong warg but he yeah. he's uh there's something real really kind of visceral in terms of the relationship with john and ghost even though he's not around all the time he knows when he's near because he's having the dreams and he can start you know he starts to kind of uh well he's walking he's walking yeah. whether he realizes it or not um so at the very end of this chapter um we have uh, well, there's a couple of things actually, uh, but be right, right at the very end of this chapter, we get John reflecting that he will that basically the Night's Watch is his lot from now to the end of his days. So, does that mean at some point he will have to leave the Night's Watch? Uh, I think so. Mm. Um. We're not getting any new POVs, so if it isn't John, it'll be Mel mm. on the wall, right? That's the only one that we'll have. I mean, uh, in the show, I thought it was really, there was part of everything. When when he died and the resurrection and everything, cinematically, it was it was, it was was great, but... I loved no, it. There yeah. was no, there was like the aftermath of that was I, I don't know what i was expecting but i didn't expect him to, to have absolutely no difference whatsoever yeah i think so, that's that's yeah. probably i thought the best two scenes to kind of there were maybe three but the best two scenes to to even kind of reference it was that scene with davos where he says look i don't it's all fucking mental i don't know what the hell is going on it was very mm. real and I liked because that's mm. that's one of the best things about this fantasy series is just the realism. Mm. You don't expect that in a fantasy series, and that's why George has won so many fans to the genre. And yeah. um, so that's great. And it's Liam Cunningham, so it's going to be brilliant as well. Um, and 
the other scene was the Battle of the Bastards. Mm. When he he's there with his sword, he sees the Bolton Calvary coming and he's just like, okay. And it's just this iconic scene where he pulls the sword and he's like, mm-hmm. okay, I've done, I've died before. I can do it again. Yeah. And yeah. They, those two, for me, they're the two weightiest scenes, but how he's going to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless, um, yeah, because we don't have Davos there. That's the problem. We only have a male POV that's possible. Isn't that right? Very, but yes, and he's very isolated at the moment, John. He's thinking already in this chapter, he can't... He's the Lord Commander now, so that changes the dynamics between him and his his friends, you know, the, his previous friends. So he can't really sit and have, have you know, his supper and have a, a, a laugh and a joke with, with the boys. Mm-hmm. It's, it's all very different. He... He, he the, the the days of him having friends are, are gone now. I know that's so sad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So he's he's on his own and he's very isolated. And it'd be very easy for him to be, you know, he's in a vulnerable position, and it's very easy to, for him mm-hmm. to be manipulated. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm glad that he's reading the stuff that my Strayman has left him. So he's not, you know, he's he's actually taking stuff on board. Um, Do you think yeah. he's reading things that he hasn't shared yet in his POVs? Things that will come become important later. Yeah, yeah. I get the I get the feeling that he knows too much already. Yeah, it's it's just he's changed. Yeah, he's changed a lot, and maybe I don't think that's PTSD, just the man. Like, mm. Maybe that's <clears throat> the thing that I was saying about Val before as well. I've just noticed in my notes that uh, three times, three times Val has tried to escape the the, uh, the reasonable luxury that she's in at the moment in the tower. Um, but he looks over to her and she's just looking up at the wall, which again makes me think she's going to be pivotal somehow in bringing it down, bringing the wall down. She just keeps looking up at the wall and then trying to escape three yeah. times. So, yeah, yeah, there's something. There's something. Th- I think the human element of at the wall has broken way too many rules. Mm. Mm-hmm. That they've built it too high. They haven't maintained the border. They've made it into something else. They haven't allowed a- access. Yeah, maybe it's not that women. That could be a night's watch thing. That women mm-hmm. aren't at the wall. It probably mm-hmm. is a night's watch thing. Maybe actually as part of the pack, there should be women at the wall. Mm. Maybe this is going completely out there. Get get ready for some tinfoil because it just popped into my head. Maybe they're supposed to be exchanging females in the species. Mm. Like the 13 Mm. Lord Commander, maybe they're supposed to be crossbreeding and maybe they're supposed to be that's that's i mean we've got marriage alliances all over westeros that's yeah. one way of assuring that pacts stay in place mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah, maybe, maybe when the knights so, watch came something. along and took away the women that yeah. was a, breaking the pact again yeah yeah so that maybe what this is about something that should be happening that isn't um and that's why the others and the you know the the whites are are on the march well it would be interesting if mel isn't necessarily killed as part of an old god or ice Mm. magic vengeance but is iced is whited Mm. if you like she Mm. is given over to the ice i mean there's famously that Mm. custom made figure that george had yeah potentially Mm. that would be interesting That would be an interesting. I think it might be her or Danny. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's all I had for John. I think yeah. um, probably my favorite chapter this week was Danny. So a nice one to end on. We're actually going to be ending on a Danny chapter next week as well because we're going to just do the five chapters next week. I'll make sure to post the schedule and redo the links and all that kind of thing. Um. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Danny too. So the big two or three kind of interactions in this are the first one with Missande, then with Quaith. Do you say Quaith or Quaithy? Because I Quaith. say Quaith. Quaith. Yeah. Because yeah. I hear people say Quaithy, but I say Quaith. Mm. Um, 
and then Barristan. Um, mm -hmm. Arguably the three most important people in her life at the moment. Yeah. Um, definitely Missandei and Barristan, arguably the two most important, full stop. Um, so we find out that Missandei loses a brother mm -hmm. and um, Danny kind of offers, you know, you can go home if you want, but Missandei says no. And I just wondered, will like Danny's kind of freeing of the slaves, Will Danny's gift of more freedom for Masande or an offer of freedom for Masande backfire and turn into a betrayal? Oh, she's totally going to be betrayed. Yeah. She's go. She's completely going to be betrayed by Masande. Um, the, 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 there's there's a real point made in this chapter about how much Masande loved her brother to the point where I think this is the only reason why she's is where she is at the moment is because of her brother um and he was he's been killed by along with eight other unsullied uh that have been you know patrolling the streets so she's gonna see what is she nine well who knows but she appears to look like she's nine years old um she's going to see Daenerys Stormborn has been directly responsible for the killing of her beloved brother. That is massively going to backfire on Danny. That's that's the betrayal for love. I'm sure it is. I think um, her brother is the role that Grey Worm plays in the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think yeah. I definitely think Missandei is the betrayal for love for sure. Mm. Uh, I don't. I, I find her deeply suspicious. Um, mm. But I do, um, yeah, I do worry about Danny's gifts and, mm. and her idealized notions of, of how she feels about certain things that she offers. Um, Lady Laura is gone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope your kids enjoy that wonderful meal. It sounds delicious. Mm. Yeah, it um, does. So, uh, yeah, the, so, yeah, I, I, Miss Sandy is dodgy af as the kids mm. say mm -hmm. but um, yeah mm. so where do you want to go with this chapter I, I'm uh, like, i'll get the prophecy ready <laughs> okay okay um well my question is is quaith uh, is she a vision or is she some sort of construct of danny's mind you know like an imaginary friend that that when you're a child you create this imaginary friend that it helps you to you know there's there's a number of reasons why you do that it helps you to um figure out what's right and wrong it, it, you know there's this manifestation when you're a child of this that you know you create this 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 friend that you want to kind of tell everything to and your deepest darkest secrets that kind of thing i'm beginning to wonder just the way that she kind of sits that she it's it's almost like um like a meditation type scenario when she sees because i i i seem to remember the you know she just walks into the the grove and like on a balcony and there's Quaith just kind of hiding behind a tree and then gives her this prophecy but it's not like that she's actually lying in the bath she's got her eyes closed and she's kind of floating in the bath and then that's when Quaith comes to her which just makes me think rather than her being like a, you know traveling project projection through the black candle or the glass candle or whatever that this is some sort of Targaryen thing that it's a, a Targaryen manifestation because all she seems to be saying is remember who you are, remember who you are. So ha basically, I, I guess what I'm saying is, has Danny created Quaith? And um, it's just in her own, it's in her own I imagination. I don't know. Um, I think of all our characters, Danny is definitely the most honest with herself and has been from day one. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. 
She sees, like, she imagines Quaith is under... Um... But it still could be very vivid. Um, uh, you know, yeah. even if she, she wouldn't look at her and go, oh, you, uh, there's Quaith, my imaginary friend. Right, okay, let me confide in you about how I'm feeling. She actually thinks, shit, where have you just come from? But she can see but... her under a persimmon tree. Mm. So it's like she's completely, like, removed the setting as well. Mm. Um, mm. And I feel like it's a massive... Like, if somebody does that, they kind of build up to it, maybe. Mm. Like, it doesn't come out as a fully formed delusion. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. I have no idea. But um, it is interesting that it's a persimmon tree because mm. and that it's a woman that appears to her, whether it's real or not, because um, persimmons are and pomegranates that's, um, and apples are often associated Fertility. with yeah and with the garden of eden mm. and eating from the tree of knowledge and that not like we westernized it i think for um as an apple mm. but it's often considered either a pomegranate or a persimmon so mm. that idea that you know quaith has given her information that maybe she shouldn't have and actually may actually harm her like the cersei prophecy does like the mm -hmm. mizzy um What's her name? Yeah, As this, door prophecy did. Yeah, like self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, exactly. Um, Connie said, Missandei can hear any foreign language Danny doesn't understand, and Miss Director, she sees fit. That is true. I never thought about that. You're totally right. That is totally true. She can completely translate whatever she wants, just like she did for Danny, right? When, mm. when mm. the dragon, uh, the, the, whatchamacallit, the unsullied trainer. Yeah, thanks, Connie. Connie, see, great. Um, <laughs> and remember who you are, mother of dragons. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who it will be, Masande, Dario, Tyrion, or John. Yeah. I oh, I think the show will go in a different direction to the books anyway, Elmore. Um, so here is the prophecy. Mm. Uh, hear me, Daenerys Targaryen. The glass candles are burning. Um. So the glass candles are burning. Let's take it in line by line. The mm. glass candles are burning. I mean, this is where everybody suggests that this vision is coming through glass candles. Mm -hmm. It might also refer to Marwyn, right, coming. Mm -hmm. um, soon comes the pale mare and after her, the others. Mm. Now, that could be anything because it's others with a small O. So mm -hmm. that could be anything. Kraken and dark flame. I'm not sure what the dark flame is. Is that the smoking? Makaro. Ah, okay. I, I thought it might be Viserion. But never mind. Uh, Lion and Griffin, the sun's sun. That's S-U-N, sun. Mm. Uh, so that's, I'm guessing, Quentin, right? Mm -hmm. And then the mummer's dragon. So a lot of people see that as being Aegon. Mm -hmm. um, trust none of them. Remember the undying, beware the perfume seneschal. And she becomes fixated on the perfume seneschal part and mm. is probably completely wrong. Uh, I think that's Varys or Illyrio or both. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm not sure what she, what she means by remember the undying. Is that to remember what they, the prophecy there? Yeah. Is that to remember the people that were there or the house? I think it's remember what they said to you. Right, okay. And I can't remember what they said to her. <laughs> uh, I thought I, I wasn't sure if it was like remember the undying is in the house of the undying because she um she has all these kind of visions there. I'll need to go back and reread them or just mm. go back and watch our stream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's it. I mean I mean a lot of it we know already, right? The pale mare. The others mm. potentially the kraken, the dark flame, the lion, the griffin. We know we know all of them pretty much. Um, mm. But the seneschal, uh, Illyrio and Varys, right? And not um, not Resnick. Um. No, no. Sorry, I was thinking about something else. Then I was thinking about the remember, 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 remember who you are. Remember the undying. There's something there as well about how it is imp it's important to remember 
but it's also well one of the most important things in terms of whether you're successful or not in this realm is to be remembered so you know remembered through song you the rich uh you know the rich tapestries of your history in terms of the the house that you're from that's all that tywin was ever interested in was about making sure that you remember you know everybody remembers because uh you know and and the, the 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 name lives on and continues the worst possible thing that you can do because eventually you will you'll be forgotten is t for for a house to be destroyed root and branch which tywin has done a couple of times I'm sure that's going to come back at some point. I'm sure there are some wow. secret reigns somewhere throughout throughout this story. Well, also, I mean, Quaith says mm. the lion, you know, that can only be Tyrion. Mm. Um, it suggests that Tyrion cannot be trusted, even though in his chapter he swears that he's going to devote himself to da Daenerys. Mm. Um even before he meets her, which seems a bit odd, impossible. Mm. But um, I, 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 th I think you're right. I think Tyrion may lead to the downfall of the Targaryen household, which may include his own brother and sister, or who he thinks are well, half brother and sister, if they're Targs, like I think they are. Um, and Connie says, because Connie always comes up with great stuff. Remember, they tried to suck your life force, and you're right, actually, Connie, because that entire list—they're all coming to Danny because they want something from her. They don't. None of them have anything really they can offer her. Um, I mean, maybe the Ironborn can offer her ships, but she'll get there eventually. I mean, look at what she's achieved in the last few years. Um, so maybe they are just going to come and. They're all there to suck something from her, literally. Um, and remember that you still have warlocks after you. Yeah, those pesky warlocks, they'll definitely turn up soon, I'd say, for sure. Yeah. But yeah. Do you think that Danny's trying to rule fairly? I think she thinks she is. I think she's. she, does, she hasn't had any uh, role models for this i mean most people have had a, have been able to most people who become king and queen even robert baratheon right he knew he was around noble houses he was around lord aaron he knew how he dealt with his vassals and things like that but danny has hasn't seen anyone rule not even on small scale really not like the way she wants to rule in westeros so I think she mm -hmm. thinks she's doing the right thing, but she's still allowing her heart to rule over her head. I think sometimes she can be quite brutal. Like, and I'm wondering whether, I mean, the only time she has really seen anyone real would be... Um, In um, Bravos. Yeah, uh, what's he called? The, the Dothraki, her husband. Oh, uh, Drogo, yeah. Drogo, which is, which, you know, and he was he was gentle with her, but he was quite brutal as a ruler. She, it's this blood tax thing that she's got, that, uh, this idea that she's got of uh, getting the masters of the pyramids to pay for extra troops to be out on the streets to fight against the Sons of the Harpy. So it's basically she's getting them to pay for the damage that they're already causing, which is, which is it seems quite clever. And I think, she, I think she probably is trying to rule as fairly as possible. Um, I think I'm, so. It's just I don't think she's had any good political role models. No. And she doesn't have any around her. Like, she doesn't really have great political mm. role. Like, I, I, I'm, of all the people on their way to her, none of them are political masterminds. No. No. And even Barristan isn't political, really, is he? I mean, he knows a lot of history but he's not he's just as emotional as she is yeah and, and he's a warrior things mm. fairly but mm. maybe not always um it just occurs to me it probably would have been much better for daenerys and doran had doran sent ariane instead of quinton yeah it would be a very different outcome i'm sure yeah, yeah. um so yeah barristan defends ned 
um and feeding. equally actually if uh if um the crow's eye had sent uh y yara yes yes yeah. not yara asha asha god yeah i should know i've got a cat called asha <laughs> instead of um thingy you know the uncle yeah Viserion. Viserion. not Viserion. that's a dragon what's Victorian. he called oh no Victorian. Victorian. Almighty. <laughs> What are we reading? I don't know. <laughs> I have, I have no it's been such a long time. I've forgotten what's what and who's who. Harry Potter is but, yeah, but I, um, I, I don't know. I don't know if she's doing the right. I, I think she's trying, but I think I think there. Is, you know, you're right. She hasn't got anyone to really. She's just. She's kind of playing at being queen, isn't she? And sometimes she gets it right. Sometimes maybe not so much. I do uh, like the yeah. conversation with Barristan because um, Danny hates the Starks. And I think mm. a lot of people align Stark and Targaryens falsely um, yeah. throughout the series. And this is really the first time that her, like somebody, like I, Jorah has before, kind of, but Barristan is very clear in tempering her negative reaction to Ned here and saying, hold up now. This yeah, guy is not who you think he is. They're actually not that bad. Yeah, yeah, and that might actually prove to be one of the most important conversations later on if mm. a Stark Targ alliance comes into play. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but that's and um, that's all I have for Danny. Even though it's my favorite chapter this week. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the, the 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 only other thing to mention at the very end of this chapter, she goes to visit the dragons, and oh, yes. you know we we make note of them being they're much larger. It, to the point where Drogon just could not be contained. Um, so he's off flying around wherever, and it's just the two dragons, but they are getting pretty big. Um, yeah. And as a reader, you can't help with, are they big enough for you to get on the backs yet and ride them and, and get up in the air? And, you know, so we're, we're constantly waiting for that moment. Marwyn crying. Marwyn crying. Oh, poor man. Um, I, I yeah. tried my nephews all week that I was going to steal my favourite nephew, which is their dog, Kobe, all <laughs> week because he keeps coming to me as well because I'm a novelty <laughs> dog. So every now and again, while they were busy, I'd just go, come on, Kobe. And I'd sneak out. I was like, my suitcase is outside. Come on. <laughs> and they just end up screaming, no, you can't take our pet. <laughs> I was like, well, let's see who he goes to. Oh, <laughs> Every time oh. to me. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, that's, oh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I've got. Really. Yeah, there was a two week gap for us, folks. Although this was nice, a nice kind of short and sweet mm -hmm. one. And um, we'll be back then next week, I guess, Claire, with uh, five chapters. I'll do redo the schedule, everybody, and I'll put it up for you guys. Uh, I might just. Sorry if like your subscription box gets filled with me putting in live streams, but I'm on holidays this week. Um, actually, I'll be in London for three days, but um, uh, hopefully my tonsillitis will clear it up. Oh, but uh, yeah, but I'll I'll redo the schedule. So we'll do five chapters next week and go from Reek One to Danny Three. It says just, John just, Four, but it's Danny Three instead. Sorry. Just a warning: don't eat anything before or during reading the next chapter oh i already started it it's Ooh. horrific yeah yeah horrific yeah really it, bad I, 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 I actually had to stop listening to it and then go back to it another time i struggled with it twice i managed to get through it but oh my it, god it reeks yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 um but yes so everybody i will see you i'll be hopefully de deflamed and de-inflamed <laughs> and uh i'm going to see three shows in london this week oh, we're really we're going to see ian mckellen in lear king lear oh my um, god wow we're going to uh uh, uh, oh God! Like at the height of the storm with Jonathan Price. Oh, uh, the High oh. Sparrow himself. Yeah, and oh, and another Game of Thrones. Uh, Jim Broadbent is in a one-man, the new um, McDonough show about Hans Christian Andersen. 
Oh um, my God. He's playing wow. Hans Christian Andersen. Yeah, Jim Broadbent. Yeah, I just remembered that because it's on preview, I think think still on preview so we got a deal so we're like jim broadband i'm for, i'm there i love him yeah, so another yeah, harry Potter yeah. connection um <laughs> so there you go so guys and girls i will see you next week thank you so much for being patient with us for the hiatus and thank you claire for being patient as well <laughs> you're welcome no no i just hope you get you feel better soon and uh yeah so we'll pick this up next week yeah. okay bye folks bye